Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us here in this, your place. Amen. Amen. There is a grumbling in America. I don't know if you've heard it. It has nothing to do with the presidential elections. It's coming from our young people in the public schools. They're telling us that they are hungry. They're protesting the Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. You know, this is the the law that has taken the junk food out of the schools and put meat and vegetables back on the plates in the cafeterias and the kids are having none of it. And they're telling us that they're starving. (laughs) But they're being creative about it, as young people tend to do. And what they've done, if you go to YouTube when you get home and you search Tonight We Are Hungry, you're going to find a song by the group Fun that they have covered. And the lyrics used to go, tonight we are young, we're going to set the world on fire. But now instead it says, tonight we're hungry. And we're going to send that hunger bill, we're going to set that legislation on fire. This is what the kids are singing. You see, they're stranded somewhere between the delicious life of Doritos and soda that they used to know and a future that we're hoping for them that will be long and healthy and with less diabetes. But they're kind of stranded in the middle and they're really longing for the taste of mint chocolate chip ice cream. And so it was with the Israelites in the wilderness of Sinai. It was like 40 years of being in the in-between place. You know, they were no longer slaves in Egypt, which is mostly a good thing, but they kind of missed the food. Every now and then they would get to taste a melon or a cucumber from the table of the masters. They weren't slaves anymore, but they also weren't yet a nation. They didn't yet have a capital called Jerusalem. They were in between. Before they had been individual families and tribes meandering, hunting, hunting and gathering. But they weren't yet a landed agricultural based shared economy. They were somewhere in between. And they had been following this guy Moses for a few years, and they were getting a little grouchy about it, frankly, because the food wasn't so good. Stuff called manna. It's like maybe it has been described as like mustard seed like powder. You have to do something with it in order to nourish yourself. And to eat that over and over again would, well, frankly, be something like eating these communion wafers every meal of your life for 40 years. (laughs) The question for American adults regarding our children's health and the question that was before God regarding his people, Israel, stranded for a generation in the wilderness was do we give them what they want Or do we give them what they need? Because what they want, what they think they want, are tastes and flavors of a time that they're not remembering very accurately. They're remembering the sweetness of the melon, but not the pain of the slavery. Joyce Roop, in her book, titled Praying Our Goodbyes, says the Exodus is a story of every pilgrim heart because there is always the movement from a place of non-freedom to a place of true freedom. She says the pilgrim heart knows that there will always be an Egypt 
that needs a goodbye. It's to say that there always will be something in us, something spiritually that enslaves us, that needs to be left behind, that needs to be set aside. It might be in our private personal life. It might be in our shared collective public life. And oh my, how often those two seem to intersect. Roop reminds us of this funny thing that we do out of our human nature, which is to long for what we used to have and focus so much on that that we miss the manna that's right before us. God offered to the Israelites and God offers to spiritual pilgrims of every time and every generation that we might live on that powdery starch dust in order to gain our spiritual freedom, in order to be released from economic or social captivity. There will always be an Egypt that needs a goodbye. There will always be an Egypt that needs a goodbye, and we should become suspicious any time that our life or our culture is starting to taste bland to us. Any time that we look around and we realize that we're not alone, other people are feeling a little bit sad, a little bit starved. In those moments, we should become very suspicious about the probability that we are in transition from a former way of life to a new way of life and that we are in between people. the American farmer and writer, Wendell Berry. He wrote just a couple years after 9-11. And he predicted that the time would come when we will not be able to remember the horrors of September 11th without also remembering our unquestioning economic optimism that ended on that day. It was an optimism that rested on a proposition that we were living in a new world order. A new economy that would grow on and on infinitely. And that as it grew, it would bring unprecedented amounts of prosperity to people all over the globe. We know that as Americans, we began to grieve in 2008 what seemed like a sudden economic recession. But that came after we, as global citizens, had been lamenting since 2001 the total annihilation of our dominant economic paradigm, a paradigm that had been based on a myth that an unfettered global market would result in world peace. May this week's rise in American consumer confidence not reflect a people in between who are craving a time gone by when we had accepted the falsehood that an economy that is global, that is technologically sophisticated, that is seemingly centralized, was invulnerable to violence. There will always be an Egypt that needs a goodbye. We in the human race are clearly in an in-between time. And what's so amazing about in-between times, and our friend and scholar Phyllis Tickle has taught us about this, that, you know, in-between times, you can't predict where they're, where, when they're going to come, But one thing you can know is that every 500 years, just in case we haven't gotten shaken up, God is going to shake it up worldwide. And what she says is so powerful about this time of being shaken up, this global era, is that the spiritual authority of our environment and our creation has descended like manna upon the grassroots of humanity around the globe. 
that's us. She says the spiritual authority of the church and of humanity has descended on the grassroots. And the question is, do we have the courage for that? Do we have the question to live in between and live with the tension of no longer being people living in dictatorships or isolationist national identities and entities? but a people who hasn't quite yet arrived to a healthy, solid, global, political infrastructure that provides for all people. Can we live with this tension and can we live into metaphors that are faithful? What is going to be, in this in-between, our governing metaphor? Are we going to long for that Egypt of free market patriotism? Are we going to get disciplined about paying a good debt to God? To say market freedom and to mean an unregulated market is to misspeak. And to say market freedom and intend to convey What you're really talking about is an unregulated market and then go further and say that market freedom is really the same thing as personal freedom? Well, that's a falsehood. Market freedom as a metaphor for global security is a deception. And the argument that the market economy will soon make government and public institutions, such as public schools, obsolete is exceedingly dangerous. And lastly, the implication that any attention at all to climate change, any effort at all to heal this earth, is somehow an intentional plot to steal away American freedom is a sham and a lie and an abomination. Francis Fukuyama prophesies when he says that a market economy and high levels of wealth, they don't just magically appear. They don't just magically appear when you get, finally get government and public institutions out of the way. Wealth and the market rest upon institutional foundations like property rights, rules of law, and basic political order. And so many of us in our culture, we've really internalized well that we, the people, are democracy. But what we need to internalize more and more is that we, the people, are the market. The market is not this abstract thing that only exists out there like some mysterious land of Oz, you know, with behind-the-scenes machinations. The market is in here. And we cannot afford to buy into metaphors that are dishonest about who we are and who are our brothers and sisters around the world. There will always be an Egypt that needs a goodbye. So how do we get there? How do we get to freedom? Walter Brueggemann says the way we get to freedom, the way we get to the other side, is to share our lament. The way we get to restoration and strength as a people is to sit ourselves down by the riverside and tell stories about how grand things used to be and to weep together over the pain of being in between. And it doesn't sound very helpful, does it, to weep together as a way to freedom, but we can look to nature for evidence that in fact it really just might work. There remain today market incentives for elephant tusks, for ivory, 
And sadly, this is leaving all of these elephant calves on the continent of Africa, a number of them who are orphaned and literally traumatized for having seen their parents murdered. But somebody cared enough to create an elephant orphanage. And these little, poor, traumatized, scared elephants are taken there one at a time if they're so blessed and so lucky, and they get to drink milk out of these huge baby bottles like you've never seen before. And each one of them has their own personal caretaker. There is not one minute in a 24-hour cycle when a calf does not have the care and attention of another human being, even when they're asleep at night. And so they feed the elephants and they nourish them and they help to heal them and remind them what tenderness feels like and what love feels like and they get older and then it's time to go. And one by one, they'll take an elephant when it's ready and they'll return it to the wilderness, this time in a national park. It's safe, no hunters allowed. And the way that we know there really is a straight to freedom by way of sharing our lament is that every single time a calf is released into that national park, the earth begins to move. And there is a trembling in the air. And somehow, intuitively, every single elephant that was ever orphaned and returned to freedom in that park knows instinctively to show up in parade and receive the new one. If it proves out in nature, then maybe the power of public lament for social transformation and justice just might be true universally. There will always be an Egypt that needs a goodbye.